does not admit of accommodation. It can be settled only by the defeat of one principle or of the other. Disillusion and disappointment at the end of 1916 did not draw men towards peace. But these feelings undermined the leaders associated with costly deadlock. In Great Britain, Lloyd George had replaced Asquith even before the German peace note was published. All Lloyd George's instinct drew him towards new methods of waging war. I thought, rightly or wrongly, that there was hesitation, vacillation, and delay, and that we were not waging this war with the determination, promptitude, and relentlessness with which it must be waged. It is a national war. Everyone must contribute, and it is on that basis alone we shall be able to achieve a great triumph. So Lloyd George became Britain's leader. In Germany, with his peace moves a failure, it was Bettmann Hollweg's turn to go. From now on, the army leaders, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, would lead Germany from behind a figurehead chancellor. So, in each country, ruthless men replaced the more moderate. Ludendorff wrote, The war had to continue, and had to be decided by force of arms. It had to be victory or defeat. As a result, there were further preparations on a large scale. The maintenance of our determination to fight, and at the same time the employment of every weapon in Germany's arsenal. The Germans believed that they had found a new and sure means to early victory. The submarine, used without restriction to sink all ships at sight, even neutrals, even Americans, approaching Allied ports. The Chief of Naval Staff was confident that the campaign would have decisive results in six months. The loss of freight and the reduction of overseas imports would produce economic difficulties in England that would render a continuance of the war impossible. Lloyd George recognized the force of this threat. The submarine must be beaten or Britain would starve. The jugular vein of Allied vitality was the sea. If that vein were once cut off, the Allied strength would soon be drained of its lifeblood. Lloyd George pressed the convoy system on a reluctant admiralty which believed it couldn't work. The larger target offered by a convoy was no more vulnerable than each single ship would have been. A submarine was unable to count on firing more than a single shot, as it was at once attacked by the escorts and the guns of the convoyed vessels. But victory at sea still depended on whether British shipyards could launch more new ships than those that sank beneath the waves. The shipyard workers were exhorted to speed construction. Lloyd George's new shipping controller began revolutionary new programs, building standardized tramp steamers, even prefabricated ships which never saw a shipyard. The third weapon against Germany's attempt to starve Britain was the very land itself. Lloyd George told his countrymen, Every available square yard must be made to produce food. The labor available for tillage must not be turned to ornamental purposes until the food necessities of the country have been adequately safeguarded.
Even the lakes in the royal parks became freshwater fisheries in the drive for food. Milk and sugar and meat remained very scarce and were only rationed by price. The burden of sacrifice fell on the poor. There were demonstrations and protest meetings against the high cost of living. This mass meeting emphatically protests against the inaction of the government on the food question. We fully recognize that the present inflated prices are largely due to the profiteers who are taking advantage of the national crisis to exploit the people of this country. Lloyd George appointed a food controller to cut down wasteful methods of distribution. He appealed to the nation to ration itself. The saving of food means the saving of tonnage, and the saving of tonnage is, at the present moment, the very life of the nation. New leaders, new methods in Britain and Germany. France, too, sought change. General Joffre, victor of the Marne, commander-in-chief of the French armies throughout the war, seemed unable to produce new ideas. His weary countrymen now associated his name with attrition and failure. The French government found itself in danger. So Joffre was sacrificed with the title of Marshal of France. General Robert Nivelle, his successor, promised what France, in her weariness and grief, so desperately wanted, swift and immediate victory. We have the formula. With it, we shall beat the enemy. French politicians clung to Nivelle with desperation. The bitterest winter in living memory gripped Europe. For the ordinary people, it was a time of hunger and cold, anxiety and sadness. But they knew their duty. They believed their cause was right. In France and Britain and Germany, there was a grim resolve to fight on. <laughs> 